With load shedding and everyday reality and taps frequently running dry, the country is facing dual energy and water crises. Many households and businesses are exploring options to reduce their reliance on the failing power and water infrastructure. But with so many options to choose from, it can be a daunting task. Welcome to End Conversation, an investic focused radio essay podcast series that offers you insights into a wide range of topics that will empower you to create, manage, grow, and preserve your wealth. Today's episode is the first of a three-part series focused on empowering solutions for sustainable living. Let's listen in now as our host, Noziko Shabalala, talks to the experts about the macroeconomic backdrop to South Africa's current woes and learn more about sustainable energy and water solutions for your home and business. Good evening. Uh, My name is Nozi Poshabalala. I'm the CEO of The Conversation Strategist. But tonight, I have the privilege of serving you as the moderator of This In Conversation. I just want to take a minute just to give you a little bit of an outline of how we're going to tackle This In Conversation. So we want to understand, for example, the state of water, the state of energy, what the government's plans are, and are those plans, according to the experts that we're going to have, on the stage sufficient to not only allow us to survive the water and the energy crisis, but are they enough to allow us to thrive on the other side? And then what we're going to do is we're going to shift gears and we're going to say, having painted the macro picture, what does the micro picture look like? What does the state of in my household look like? And how do I take control and exercise my own agency to make better decisions with regards to water and electricity usage within my own household? To kick us off then, I'm going to start with our panelists and our experts for our first conversation. I'm starting off with Chris Yelland. He's, uh, he is an energy analyst at EE Business Intelligence. Also joining us is Professor Anthony Turton or Tony Turton. So let me then kick us off in our first conversation. I'm going to uh, start off uh, with you and I'm going to ask you just to paint the picture of the state of water in the country. What does that look like right now? I think there are two things that are relevant to our conversation tonight. The first thing is that in 2002, the National Water Resource Strategy Number 1, which is the first uh, uh, legally mandated uh, high-confidence study that was ever done on on the, the balance of water available versus the water being demanded, that National Water Source Strategy number one indicated that South Africa had allocated 98% of all the water we have available at a national level. In other words, there was only 2% of the water left to be allocated to existing lawful users. Now, it's very complicated stuff underneath it, and we haven't got time to go into all of that. But the important thing is that in 2002, we effectively ran out of water. And what, uh, just to give you some of the numbers that I seem to have become notorious for now, um, uh, you know, there are a couple of numbers that are important. And the one number was that the National Water Source Strategy told us that we had 54 billion cubic meters of water per annum. That's our annual average water in the, in the country. And uh, it, it also told us that of, of that water, we've got 38 billion cubic meters in all the dams. And I, immediately I can see the look in your eyes and you say, oh, but 38 is smaller than, smaller than 54, so we can, you know, we can just build more dams. Well, we can't for very many reasons, and we haven't got time to go into that, uh, unfortunately, now. Uh, but just accept it from me. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we, we, we can't do it. But what I can say is that subsequent to that uh, study, we've had to revise that number down. 54 has been revised down eventually to 48, incrementally over time. And that's because the mathematical models have improved and also because a whole bunch of other issues, particularly climate related, have also changed. So the simple reality, the take home message is that we don't actually have any water left to allocate and we have to start doing better things with what we have. That's really, that's really the, the, the take-up message. And the other take-up message that we need to understand because it contextualizes a whole lot of other issues that you might see on a daily basis. And that is that yeah, I'm sure you've been bombarded by this thing called the green drop and the blue drop and the no drop report. So what does it mean? Okay. Well, it means that in South Africa, because we have always been a fundamentally water-constrained economy, the, the engineering philosophy that, is, that has underpinned all of the design at national level has been what is known as an indirect reuse model. 
And the indirect reuse model means that all of the water coming through the economy that comes out of a wastewater pipe into a sewage works has to be treated to a high standard, and that's the green drop report. Because where it comes out of that pipe at the end of the process, it goes back into the river, and then it goes into your water treatment plant for making your drinking water, and that's the blue drop report. So the last uh, report that we heard uh, uh, that uh, suggested that only 3% of our water coming out of the wastewater works is compliant. So only 3% of the sewage works are compliant, and that is a bad number. 97% are non-compliant in some form or other. About 40 to 50% are totally, totally, absolutely non-compliant. So it's a range of badly non-compliant to not so badly non-compliant, but still non-compliant. So that's, no, that's, that's the, the, the bottom line. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think it's a great way of painting the picture. And as you talk about 2002, um, well, it was the year that we actually officially became a water constrained country. Uh, and we think about how much time has passed since then and the condition or situation we find ourselves in now. Let me then swing over to you, Chris, and say exactly the same question. Um, we're all familiar with load shedding, but if we were just to lift our heads a little bit from a strategic perspective, how would you describe the state of energy or the state of electricity in the country? Well, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine it's not a good picture. I mean, we feel it every day, as you, as, as you mentioned. Uh, but if you're looking at the state of electricity, you've got to look at the state of ESCOM, and you've got to look at the state of municipalities, because together they form the electricity supply industry. Mm. So ESCOM, as you know, is divided into generation, transmission, and distribution. We don't have enough available generation capacity. We have enough capacity, but it's not always available because of maintenance and breakdowns and things like that. So we experience this day to day. So no big surprises there. Transmission is not performing too badly. I mean, the power is getting from the sources of generation through the grid to the various cities and places around the country. Uh, so it's performing pretty well, but it's been underinvested for more than a decade. And so we're beginning to see now uh, little wobbles. Uh, access to the grid by uh, new generation capacity is becoming difficult. There's also constraints on the backbone of the grid. As you generate more power into it and transport it over the grid, some of the areas are starting to show signs of uh, they, need, uh, they need upgrading. You need to upgrade yeah. the backbone. So we need serious investment. Same with generation, by the way. We need serious investment. Um, and then finally, we get to distribution. ESCOM does distribution. And it's not so different from the municipal distribution. And, uh, well, we know what happens in the distribution network. About half of the power outages you probably experience are not due to generation capacity constraints, not due to grid constraints, but are due to problems on the distribution network. Yeah. So ESCOM is half of the problem. Municipalities are half of the problem. Uh, it's not a pretty picture, but I just want to say, let's not focus all, all on the doom and gloom. There are some really interesting green shoots coming. And if we do the right thing, in fact, do several right things simultaneously yeah. for a few years, we can solve this problem. There are only a handful of countries in the whole world that have four to eight hours of load shedding every day. Only le less than five, and we're one of them. And we should not be one of them because we've got a young population, a lot of human energy, an underdeveloped human population with a lot of potential. We've also got abundant energy reserves, abundant. And I just want to say we do not have an energy crisis. We have a kind of a management crisis of getting the electricity from the point of generation and to, to where it's needed. Let me be the devil's advocate here. Let me be the dampener of the optimism and your bullishness, Tony. There could be naysayers who say, the more we seem to be talking about or, in, or seem to be encouraging people moving off the grid and reliance and exercising agency and not sitting back and doing nothing, that we're actually encouraging a mass migration off the grid if something like that is possible. And could that not top, uh, cripple our municipalities? Could that not weaken um, the municipalities who don't have enough revenue now to then uh, offer public services as they should be. So let me, I'd, I'd love for you to both take a bite at this. So maybe first one to you, Chris. Is this good for South Africa that people are reducing their reliance on the grid? Yeah. 
there's a lot of loose talk about off-grid. And let me be clear, we're not talking about going off-grid. Yeah. We're talking about supplementing our energy needs with additional energy while still remaining on the grid. Uh, the grid is a really important enabler and connects uh, people and uh, households and uh, factories uh, together. And it, it enables a level of efficiency that cannot be achieved in standalone off-grid solutions. And in fact, nobody amongst you, I'm sure, is actually off-grid. You have a grid-tied system or a hybrid system. Uh, so we just got to be clear on the terminology mm. here. Mm. But to answer your question, I believe that people who install battery and rooftop solar PV are part of the solution and not part of the problem. By the, and, and, and I've heard the argument that, uh, that this rooftop is for rich people and it's anti-poor. I don't buy it. I believe the more people that install rooftop and battery in storage, yeah. the better for everyone. It's a win-win situation. You're going to benefit because you're going to have increased security of supply and you might even save some money. Yeah. Eskom is going to benefit because you're reducing the burden that they currently are unable to meet. The more people that install these systems, the more you're reducing their burden that they're unable to meet. You're not taking revenue away from them. They're already losing that revenue now as we speak. Uh, and, and lastly, all those people that are not installing rooftop, they're going to benefit because they're going to have reduced load shedding because right. the burden of the, of Eskom is being reduced, uh, so th uh, so there's going to be uh, more to supply everybody. Same so, you, yeah, Tony. Uh, yeah, just quickly, uh, I I personally don't buy into the uh, the excuse by municipalities that if uh, we're going to put them out of business, I think they're doing a pretty good job of doing that themselves at the moment. Now, <laughs> the the, fir the the first thing they have to do is just start improving their efficiencies, and if they can improve their efficiencies and get you know, get the biggest bang for the buck that they've got at the moment, then you know, then we're going to start moving forward. So I don't buy that argument whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I also don't buy the argument that there's a shortage of money. They'll always say there's a shortage of money because they're allocating the money to the wrong thing. So we need to have proper allocation of, you know, of, of, of resources. To, uh, we need to have qualified, competent people uh, implementing sustainable and well thought through plans. And we're going to be smiling, happy people. So I think it's a beautiful place, actually, then, just to uh, shift gears a little bit. I'm going to invite two additional experts to join us because we're shifting gears. I'm going to start off with financial journalist Maya Fisher-French. And then uh, joining us and final uh, experts is water solutions expert Pierre Landberg. I want us to start at the point of grid reliance, uh, reducing grid reliance. And that's only because in every WhatsApp group, whether it's your family WhatsApp group, your street WhatsApp group, your school WhatsApp group, Everybody's talking about how do I reduce my grid reliance? And I don't want to talk big fancy ideas. I want to talk practical things that we can start doing at home, in our houses, from tomorrow. So Maya, so what are some of these? So we're all here worrying about our water um, security and our energy security. And I think it's a bigger issue. We need to understand that we are dealing with limited resources, globally limited resources. And anything that we consume is going to have an impact on the environment. So even renewable energy, right? To mine lithium, you're mining it in the salt pans of Bolivia, which is affecting the water um, uh, quality in Bolivia. So these are, are things that we need to start considering. We need to start looking at ourselves as consumers and saying, how do we be more efficient and use the resources we have more efficiently? Then when we bring it into our home, and especially if you're looking at putting in solar systems, it is you need to make your house as energy efficient as possible before you put it in, because that means you need less of a system. You need to spend less money. So the starting point is you have to put in a gas stove. You're not going to be able to power your electric oven with an inverter. Okay, don't even try, it's not gonna work. So a gas stove, for example, then you go and you do the basics. You put in your, um, your LED lighting, you get lighting efficiency. You also can put in, of course, a solar geyser. And one other thing that you should really do with your geyser, and I don't know if anyone's done this, um, is you actually wrap your geyser in a blanket. So those are things that you can really do that are very, very practical in terms of reducing your, your energy usage. But I kind of felt that I wanted to give this audience three things yeah. that they can do tomorrow morning that's going to change the world. So the first thing is wash your clothes in cold water. Your clothes will last longer, and according to Malcolm Gladwell, 
<laughs> you will save the planet. Massive energy efficiency. Also, phosphorus-free, um, phosphate-free detergents, but apparently most of us have that because Unilever, I think in 2014, took phosphates out of all of our, our detergents, so that's a really good one. And the third one, eat brown sugar. Don't <laughs> use white sugar. White sugar takes a huge amount of energy to turn it from brown to white. So little simple things that you can do to change the world tomorrow, Nozzy. What's available in the market from an energy backup perspective that we should be thinking about? Talk to us a little bit about the cost. We all have one thing or another, but maybe just give us a sense of some of the big ones and the pros and cons. Over to you, Chris. Okay, so fortunately with, uh, with solar PV and battery storage, it's actually quite simple. It's not like water. Ooh, you're going to hear about the complications with water, but electricity is battery, inverter, and solar PV. And you can start small, with a battery and an inverter, it's going to sort out your, 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 your security of supply. You're not going to even feel load shedding anymore. Uh, wonderful. It's going to cost you like 60, 75,000 Rand for a fair size uh, system that will sort you out. Obviously, it depends on the size of your house, etc. Yeah. But I think you can talk about 50 to 75,000 Rand. Of course, the battery is modular. You buy a five kilowatt hour module, but you can stack 10 kilowatt hours, 15 kilowatt, you know, five kilowatt hour modules. So you can expand them as you may see fit. Uh, your inverter is not easy to expand. So you need to think about an inverter in your final, okay, because it's not like modular that you can add on extra inverter capacity. So you need to think about an inverter for the final situation. Solar PV, by, by the way, the, the battery store is wonderful. Sort out your, uh, your load sharing problem, but it's not gonna save you money is actually going to cost you more money because you're going to use more electricity because the, of the round-trip efficiency of the charging of the battery. But if you want to save money, the next step is to invest in solar PV. Very nice. Also modular. You, can, you don't have to buy the, you know, the Rolls-Royce. You can start and expand it, do it in a modular way. And I, I think most people will be spending probably 150, 150,000 to 200, 250,000, depending on the size of your house, and how big your family is, what's your electricity consumption. And I like your point, get in energy efficient first, yeah. because that's going to save you money, uh, because you, you're not going to have such a big system that you might not need if you were to do energy efficiency. So, Pierre, let's come to you. Water backup solutions, that, this is the place where we are, there's a lot more uncertainty for many of us in terms of the decisions we need to make there. What's in the market? What should we be thinking about? How much is it going to cost us? Cool. Let me do that. What I normally want to really <coughs> talk to is water security. And uh, in the Constitution, it's up to the government to ensure that we get access to SANS 241 water, which means it's good water. Uh, so that's everything that we need to get out of it. So let's just put that into context. Water security is two things, accessibility of and quality of water. So those are the two things that we've got to continuously look at. So when you're evaluating any solution, those are the things that are got to come into play. So typically what we're looking at is backup systems on a municipal uh, feed. So it's a municipal backup solution where you've got your water on a bypass going into a tank, from the tank with a variable speed drive pump, because if you don't have a variable speed drive pump, then you're going to have problems when somebody else is showering and you go and switch on a tap, somebody's going to get the moor in with you. And then, uh, <laughs> but uh, a variable speed drive pump is always a good thing and preferably a filtration system that goes into the house. So on demand and as you're using water, so your tank is filling. You may not store water in a tank and leave it there. Can't do that. Okay. Anthony will talk to that a bit later, but it is illegal. Secondly, and those cost about 35 to 55,000 Rand, depending on the size, depending on what you have to put in place, depending on the piping, and all of those type of things that you need to ensure you've got in place. Borehole solution. The first thing I've got to say about borehole, everybody talks about my borehole. That's your hole. It's not your water. The water belongs to the state. That's one thing that's got to be absolutely clarified. So what you've got to understand is if you are going to consider going borehole, understand the process that you want to go through. Secondly, when you go and drill for the borehole and the water comes, 
let's go and understand what the yield is because the yield is and the recharge is going to de define what do I need on surface to be able to meet my demand. So you need to understand your demand and understand what your peak flow demand is. Because peak flow is when people are showering early in the mornings and early in the evenings. That's when your highest uh, flow rates are there. You don't want to chase water through your filtration, so you need to manage your peak flow. So that's what you've got to take into consideration. Then, when you have got your water out and you've let it run for a while, you've got to get it tested by a lab so that the determinants can define the treatment train that is required. No borehole is the same. All right. In Cape Town, we have various challenges. We have E. coli in the northern suburbs. We have huge mang manganese and iron. And the levels of manganese and iron here in Cape Town demand flocculation. So it's a different treatment process. And then we have, obviously, uh, tannins and color in Cape Town because we are closer to the coast. And this also requires different levels of treatment. So when you start considering borehole treatment, and before you put the infrastructure in, understand what the water is going to tell you, understand what it's going to cost you to treat, and understand what the maintenance cost is going to be to ensure that you are continuously treating that. Mm. That can cost you anything from sinking a borehole to your full treatment. 120,000 for sinking, plus 120, 130,000 for a filtration system if you've got complicated water. And if you are at the complicated water stage, it's about two grand a month to ensure you've got the correct maintenance solutions in place for those things. These are considerations you need to take into consideration. You have to take into consideration. The next one is people talk about rainwater harvesting. Tank on the gutters into the house. You may not do it. Rainwater is not potable water. It has to be treated. And if you go and read the Cape Town bylaws, any of these things, you have to get permission to do it. Okay. But, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, I'll do it and say sorry afterwards. But that's another story. <laughs> so, uh, but if you are going to put rainwater into the house, make sure that you treat it properly. Understand its corrosivity. Remember, you've got birds on the roof. You've got rats on the roof. They all do what we do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that creates bacteria. And that bacteria goes into the water. The tanks are standing in the sun and they heat up and they go up and down. And that's the best breeding ground for different types of diseases, including Legionnaire's disease. Okay. You need to understand that you cannot put it into the house without treatment. And it's also highly corrosive. Typical rainwater in South Africa, 5.6 pH. 5.6 pH is going to eat your piping. You've got mm. copper piping, old houses, it's going to eat your piping. And then it doesn't matter what filtration system you've got on. You're going to start ingesting metal. So it is, becomes non-potable. Mm. Understand that. The next one we go to is grey water harvesting. Grey water harvesting is a good thing to do when you've got the economies of scale. Yeah. Buildings. But when you start going to small... E Grey water harvesting, remember, you've got to take water from your showers. You've got to take it water from your washing machine. You cannot take it from the toilet. No. You cannot take it from the sink where you're washing mm. plates with fat, grease, and oils. You cannot uh, put that into grey water harvesting. Grey water harvesting, then you'll use for irrigation, and you'll recirculate it into your house for toilet use. But understand the economies of scale. So it's all understanding that. Go to the service providers and understand what the cost is. Do the cost-benefit analysis. Then we're looking at blended solutions. People are blending municipal and all of these type of solutions. A simple thing is treat for the worst. Right. That's it. Treat for the worst. And then uh, you're also getting the new things that are happening. A lot of, number of the hotels here in Cape Town are doing it. The hotels are running on borehole water for the infrastructure. And I know the hilltop triple tree, big plant underneath with a borehole water for the infrastructure, and then they're running atmospheric water generators to generate water for their kitchen and, and potable water and things like that. So there are things that are coming up. And they've also got in the triple tree, they've got these water dispensers uh, with no bottles because they've got atmospheric water generators. 
that are doing those dispensers. So you're changing your logistics around and all of that type of stuff. And it's water from air. So those are the typical things. And then, as I said previously, if you don't have access to any of that, just put a simple filtration system on a point of use. Yeah. So I, I, I and I let I, I let uh, Pierre really give us that because I think sometimes we just need that uninterrupted list of options and possibilities. So thank you very much for for that insight. One of the things you spoke about though, Pierre, was economies of scale. So I want to bring that to you, Tony. We know there's opportunity to leverage economies of scale when we start looking at body corporates and homeowners associations and the likes. What are some of the issues there that perhaps we need to address in order to make those viable communal water options? Yes, without any question of doubt, Economics 101 tells you that economies of scale matter. And ultimately, uh, there are a couple of things here. First is the, the cost per unit of water consumed or processed or stored uh, uh, is definitely better if you can share that cost uh, distributed over a, a couple of people. And uh, the second thing is expertise, because you have to actually understand certain fundamental things related to chemistry and physics and maybe biology and most people don't understand those things so when you're starting to make decisions about to turn a pump on or off or, or to change a filter or do, to do something you need to understand those things and it's best to have that i think uh, 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 um, vested into something like a body corporate or homeowners association now not everybody lives in those sort of circumstances but there is an increasing trend in south africa that people are moving into this type of situation and what we are seeing now is that uh, um, as municipalities are increasingly coming under pressure, not so much in Cape Town. Cape Town is very much the outlier. But for the rest of the country, as municipalities are increasingly failing, then what you're starting to see now is your homeowners association, the body corporates, they are starting to pick up the slack mm. and they, they, are, they are providing services. However, you know, there's always a downside to these things because when the state is the service provider, they are legally obliged to do certain things. And if somebody gets sick or something happens, then someone can be held accountable. So when you now, you now become the service provider, then there's a whole lot of culpability or liabilities that come with it. And for this reason, you find that a lot of body corps, A, don't understand it, and B, they tend to be quite afraid of these things. Mm. But you know, the simple reality is that uh, at national level, uh, I don't see the uh, the ship being turned around easily in the next in the next 12 months. Certainly not. Uh, maybe the next decade. Uh, you know, if we're really lucky. So I can see a lot more of this is going to start happening. And once again, now on the solution side, there I think you're going to start seeing your entrepreneurial type of people coming forward for, for you know, to to provide those solutions to 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 take to outsource the liability, if you like, you know, from from your 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 trustees or your you know the directors or uh, whatever. But all of these things have got consequences. I just mentioned the one consequence now, the unintended consequence, for example, of storing water in a tank. Um, uh, Pierre mentioned now that if the, if the tank stands in the, in the sun, uh, it gets hot, the water inside gets hot, hot water rises, cold water sinks, and you get what's known as thermal stratification, so different layers of water, different temperature, and roughly in the middle of the tank, you get a temperature around about 30 odd degrees, and once it gets that magic number, 30 to 32, all the bugs in there just go crazy. They go on steroids and they just go crazy. And there's one particular thing that we don't even test for. I used to be at the CSR in my previous life and we, we don't even test for that because it's everywhere. And that's Legionella. Legionella. So Legionella is in the water everywhere, all of you know, but it's dormant because it hasn't hit that magic number of 32. And once it hits that magic number of 32, it just goes crazy. And it's, 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 a, it's a thing that uh, it, it, is, uh, it is potentially lethal. In fact, one of our previous ministers, Edna Molewa, uh, passed away as a result of this. And it's not a thing that you ingest. It's not a thing that you drink. It's a thing that you breathe in in the shower. It comes in the mist, it comes in the, you know, the fog. And in fact, it's something that's associated with, uh, for example, public outdoor spaces, you know, where you get a, a fountain or something like that in, a, you know, in a park where you take your dog for a walk. So just remember that, you know, previously in hospitals, we had lots of fountains, the decorative stuff. Yeah. Go and look at hospitals now, there's no fountains. <laughs> they were that's, killing people. That's it. <laughs> so, so I want to spend a little bit of time with you, Maya, because I think there's, a, there's maybe a three-pronged question I actually want to put to you. The, the first question and the second are probably related. The first part of the question is, we hear a lot about um, selling power back into mm. the grid. At what point is there financial benefit? Mm. The second uh, part of the question is, how do I think about 
renovating versus I'm in an old home and I want to make changes or I'm in a new home? Are there different considerations depending on the type of home? And then lastly, and I'm going to give you a lot of time for, for you to land all of these sure. things. Talk to us about insurance. Let me quickly take the insurance one because that's probably yeah. the shortest. When you tell your insurer that you have these panels on, on your roof, the first thing they do is they come back, they say, make sure you have a certificate of compliance. Yeah. Because if you don't, and it burns down your house, you're not covered. So extremely important. The other reason is for building insurance to make sure that you're fully insured because you obviously your, prop your property, uh, the building cost of replacing your building has gone up. So extremely important to inform your insurer. The city of Cape Town also requires you to get permission before you put the system in. And I know up till now, the installers have been saying, look, we submit them, but it's taking so long to get uh, approval, we're going ahead with the installation anyway. And I've just seen City of Cape Town's getting a bit tense about this. So keep that in mind. But in, in, Ca in Cape Town, you do have to get permission. That also, of course, fits in with the, with the insurance question. Um, in terms of costs um, of <laughs> the financial benefit, mm. and I'm going to end off a little bit with feeding mm. back into the grid. So in terms of the costs, um, I, you know, people, a lot is being made that you put the solar system in, it'll pay for itself. Mm. Especially the rental guys, they're saying a lot about these things. And, and you've got to be a little bit circumspect there. So if, for example, you take a system of 150,000 Rand, that's what ours cost us, by the way, 150,000 Rand, and you, either you're financing it at prime, um, or you're investing, you're taking money that you would have invested somewhere else. It's an opportunity cost. So I'm saying, well, it's a 15-year system. That's what it's guaranteed for. Um, if I'm paying it off over 15 years, that's about 1,700 Rand a month. I'm not yet getting 1,700 Rand a month from my electricity saving. I'm getting saving, but not quite that much. But obviously, as electricity prices are rising and they have just risen up a lot. When I, filled, when I did my, my meter the other day, I was quite surprised at how much, how many less units I'm getting for the same price. The electricity prices are going up, and obviously as interest rates come down, at 7% uh, prime rate, it was 1,300 rand. So it is obviously going to be, it will pay for itself over time. Um, in terms of the rental systems, you know, there's a debate, should I rent the system? People are arguing, right. yes, because then I can upgrade the technologies. It's very expensive to rent. Right. I had a look at these systems. They're highly specced. Um, I asked my electrician to look at them, and he said they are so, they're kind of like a Rolls Royce when you can get away with a Toyota. Highly specced. You're looking at about 3,000 to 3,600 Rand a month. You're not going to get the energy saving to cover that cost. So be, be realistic about that. Um, you can improve your efficiency and get more out of your solar by, by really maximizing your battery. So what we've done, for example, is we've made sure that our battery is 100% powered by the sun. It's filled, up, it's filled by, by the solar. Um, and then in the evening, and you can only do this, and Chris will tell you, in stages like one and two, maybe stage three, we run at night, the battery. So we actually use the sun at night uh, for the first few hours. Obviously, when you're getting to stage six, you need that battery <laughs> to keep going. But though, if you can, you can maximize your efficiency from the, from the battery and really get a lot more of your payback. But I know the big question is around selling into the grid. Obviously, right now, it's going to put a smart meter in. It's going to cost you 12,000 Rand. Our mayor has said he's working on a, uh, on a deal that they're going to bring them in at 6,000 Rand. You're getting back 1 Rand 25 uh, per kilowatt hour. You would have to have a pretty big installation for that to start making sense. I have a different view. I think that rather than us who, quite frankly, are privileged enough to be able to afford to put a system in our house. What I would rather do is that the mayor gave me a smart meter for free. I put it in, and he can have all my excess energy to help subsidize other people's um, electrical needs. You're bringing in all of these backup systems into the house, including energy backup systems. What are some of the hazards mm -hmm. that you just need to be looking out for so that you don't end up with accidents? Yeah, you're making your house more complicated. And there is the potential for things going wrong, uh, the more complicated it gets. Uh, but just to mention a few, uh, the solar PV panels. You switch off your inverter, you think you're safe to climb on the roof and clean your panels. If the sun is shining, there's voltage on the panels. If they're all connected in series, that voltage can be lethal. So uh, uh, this idea of a safety feature to have zero DC voltage on the roof when you need zero voltage on the roof. That is a safety feature that in some countries has become mandatory. In South Africa, is not mandatory. 
uh, and people don't know this. They think you can go up and clean your panels and put a hose pipe on. Uh, no, be careful. There's voltage on the roof, even when you think there isn't. Secondly, on, on the PV panels, if you have, look, there's a lot of connections. Eh? They're all interconnected. If you have a loose connection, you can get DC arcing. DC arcing is like a welding torch on your roof. It's, it's really high temperature. It's very hard to extinguish a DC arc, and it can cause a fire. Uh, so uh, those on the PV panels. On the, on the inverter, I would be careful not to install the inverter in a cupboard, and then you close the cupboard. You need ventilation. It gets hot. These inverters give off heat. Some of them have fans. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you need to put it in a well-ventilated area. I would, there are some inverters that are designed to be mounted on the outside wall. You put a little lean-to arrangement over them to protect them from direct sunlight, but they, 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 it's a, I think that's a good idea. Um, and then moving on to the battery, most of your systems will be lithium-ion batteries. Lithium fires are very difficult to put out. Uh, and if a cell inside your battery pack goes into thermal runaway, it causes a little fire inside the box, and then the, the cells next to it get hot, and they also go into thermal runaway, and you get a fire, and you, a normal fire extinguisher doesn't work. And if you spray them with water, you're making it worse. You remember at school in chemistry, take a bit of lithium, put it in a glass of water, it goes mad, it reacts with the oxygen, it gives off hydrogen, the hydrogen catches fire, and you've got a fire. So you put lithium with water, you get a fire. So you need very special chemicals to put out a lithium fire. You can get fire extinguishers for this purpose, but you know, it means that somebody's got to pick up the fire extinguisher and do, the, do it. By that time, well, maybe you're not even home when the fire starts. You know, maybe there's nobody to do this. So you, you need to think about making sure you don't, I think it's a good idea to put your lithium battery on the outside wall. And there are batteries that are designed for this purpose. Put them in your garage, but don't put them in your house. And yeah. don't put them inside a cupboard where there's no ventilation. Let's bring water safety in. Um, I think to a large extent, Tony, um, our understanding is sort of limited maybe to water safety. We think about safety around pools and other water bodies in our, in our homes. But now as we bring in back, uh, water backup solutions and so on, what are the core things we just need to be looking out for to make sure that everyone is safe? Yeah, remember, water uh, is a life-giving resource. So you, anything that can creep and crawl and fly and swim will eventually find its way in your water. And there's, there's a famous thing called a rat tail maggot, which just sounds like a wonderful thing. Okay? This is associated with bad, nasty sewage water. But uh, remember that your tanks can, can, can give rise to, uh, to, to mosquitoes, and mosquitoes can keep you awake at night. And uh, also remember the drowning, the drowning risk. You know, kids are, 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 are inquisitive. They're going to go and fiddle around there. And if you fall into a tank for whatever reason, it's not easy to get out of it again. So just remember that any... Any change to any system, any one of the engineers out here will know that once you change a system, there's always some unintended consequence that arises. And I'll just give an example. I've been through, since I last saw you, I've been through one of this, these things. So I've got one of these uh, inverters and batteries and all that kind of good stuff. And I've also got a water backup system. And uh, lo and behold, what should happen? But my geezer element should go while I'm here on the roadshow. So, so the geezer element goes, my wife is all distressed now. So I say, well, you know, it's not a plumbing problem, it's an electrical problem. So we get the electrician out. And he, what does he do? He botches the job. So now the earth leak is coming up and down, and that's not working. So he's blaming now the, the inverter installer. And I say, no, 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 I'm a no-nonsense kind of guy. And I say, no, 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 you, you, you own that monkey. That's your problem. You own it, okay? You fix it now. But nonetheless, um, eventually coming back and forth three times, you had to come out and sort it out. And the one contractor blames the other because no one mm. wants to accept responsibility. That's just the nature of the beast. Once you change a system, you're always going to have unintended consequences. And you, it's almost like a Murphy's law always think and you know, plan on what what is the worst possible thing that can go wrong and you're probably not going to be too far wrong yeah, mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything that we've discussed tonight can actually happen if only we have a mindset shift followed by behavioral shift and it just starts with believing that there's a different way of doing things so tomorrow we're putting a billboard outside the convention center here in Cape Town. 
And the billboard starts with three words. If we just. And you've got to complete the sentence. And your sentence needs to be a call to action for behavioral change or mindset change, reflective of this conversation. Now, let's see how we close this off. If we just, peer. If we just remember that our grandfathers saw water in rivers, and if we don't do something about it, we're going to see water in our tears. That's it. Whoa! Let's give him a big round of applause. Let, um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to procure a little bit more space for that billboard. But it's an excellent, excellent line. Thank you so much, Pierre. Let me go to, to Maya. If I'm so glad I'm in, because I'm going to steal the one that came through earlier, which was bath. Bucket, bowl. I like that. Love it. Yeah. If we just bath, buckets, and bowl. Let's give her a big round of applause. Um, Chris, if we just. If we just made the customer and the private sector part of the solution, we would be halfway there. Let's give him a big round of applause. And uh, Tony, you get to take us home. If we just. If we just dare to think differently, the possibilities are endless. Wow, <laughs> let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you for listening to In Conversation on Investec Focus Radio SA. The next episode in this series is a deep dive into renewable energy options. And the third episode is all about on-premise water harvesting and storage. To make sure you don't miss an episode, Follow Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, please take a moment to rate us on your podcast platform.